I'm going to start by talking about a personal experience. My cousin Doug lives in Vermont. Last summer, he called me in a panic. Um, late summer, he had planted uh, some oak trees on his little property in Vermont, and he put a lot of mulch around them. And then he discovered worms that were very active and very present. You can see in this picture at least four different worms right on the top of the surface, maybe five if you count these guys. So they're, they're, they're multiple, there's lots of them and they're very active. And they're quite large. This is an oak seedling and you can see how large the worms are uh, quite close to it. So it's a real problem. Um, this presentation is going to talk about what an invasive species is, um, what jumping worms are, why they are a problem, why we should care, what is being done, and what we can do. Now, I, the reason I think that you wanted this presentation is you want to do a plant sale in the spring, as we do. So we have done a lot of work in getting ready for that. And at the end of this presentation, we'll address some techniques that you can use for a plant sale. Um, there was an, this picture is from an article that was in the Star and Trib last April. Um, first, let's define an invasive species. As most of you know, the world is pretty connected today and um, species move from place to place in a great number of ways. The next four slides are taken from a presentation by Angela Gupta, who is a University of Minnesota educator. But I thought they, were, they really helped define the difference between uh, native, invasive, and that kind of thing. There are non-native species that aren't invasive. There are non-native species that cause harm, and those are the invasives. There are native species that we're not real fond of, but they're not invasive because they're native. So non-natives would be apples and honeybees. We like them both. They're not invasive. They don't displace any other, they don't cause harm or destroy a, a, a variety of things. Right. Obviously, buckthorn and the ash borer are both causing tremendous harm in our, our environment. One of the important things about the jumping worm is that it is what we call, what has Ms. Gupta describes as an emerging invasive species. There's new invasive species that we know could come, and that was the jumping worm 10 years ago. And the jumping worm now, where it's not terribly widely distributed, but it's in some places, and then our buddy buckthorn and uh, emerald ash borer, which are everywhere. Um, one, I, I've done a lot of things with invasive species. I've never seen this slide before. But one of the things that's so um, difficult about the jumping wor worms in general is that they change the soil. And when you change the soil, different species can live in that soil or thrive in that soil. And the native species are, are pushed aside. They're overrun by... Uh, plants that, that take advantage of the soil change, which is not the native situation. Buckthorn being example, ticks are more prevalent because of soil change and um, the uh, change in the uh, vegetation. Obviously fire and drought and nutrients and all these things affect people, the economy and the environment. So <clears throat> invasive species can have a very <laughs> wide ranging impact. And I'll, I'll say right now that, that this slide is entitled Worm Impact. There are no native earthworms in actually in the entire United States, specifically not in the upper Midwest because the glaciers took them out years, you know, obviously long ago. So any earthworm that exists was imported from um, Europe to start with. Uh, mostly in plants, in ship, ship, ship ballast, because they put dirt in the ships in the old days to keep them level. And obviously when people brought plants and uh, 
as you know, the emerald ash borer probably came in wood pallets, that kind of thing. So um, anyway, earthworms are not native and, and they all of them do damage, but the, the uh, jumping worm does damage much more quickly than the other ones. And one really unpleasant aspect of invasive species is that they displace a lot of, a whole sequence of things. They displace um, the plants that certain things eat. And then, so those things don't exist. So the things that eat them don't exist. And the things that live on the things that live on the things don't exist. And the decomposers go away. The whole environment changes to a different set of uh, creatures, usually ones that are very uh, aggressive and, and, and can function well in the rapidly changing environment. Uh, jumping worms, about them. You probably know that they're very active when disturbed. They are in general larger than regular earthworms. They get up to be 18, up to eight inches. Usually that's a little long, but that's, they can do that. And one of the huge differences is they live in the top few inches of soil. Most earthworms go deeper into the soil. Some of them go as far as five feet, but jumping worms live in that top couple of inches, particularly in the leaf litter or the mulch or the compost or things that they really enjoy eating. <clears throat> they love mulch. I think you probably have heard that they change the soil <laughs> to appear like coffee grounds. And that's really kind of a hard thing to take a picture of, but the soil here actually looks different. If you were at a picture of regular soil, it's just a more clumpy, it looks, it's the, it's the worm castings and it's, it's a different texture. It doesn't hold moisture. It does it. The nutrients have been eaten out of it. Um, they strip the soil of nutrients. And if they eat everything else, then they start eating plant roots. Um, they do tend to like, wetter and shadier spots. So you're more likely to find them under leaves in a shady wet spot than you will out in the in a native garden where you have straight sun. Also something like this year where we had a drought is actually uh, not good for them. So hopefully there'll be a decrease in their numbers because of last summer's drought. That's also true of Japanese beetles. They need a wet grass to put their eggs into midsummer, and we didn't have that this year. So I'm really hoping for a reduction in Japanese beetles next year due to the drought. So there's always a, sometimes a silver lining in a bad situation. Um, jumping worms have been identified in the Midwest for about 10 years. They probably arrived in plant material from Asia in the dirt. Um, we don't, they are an Asian worm. All the rest of the earthworms are European. They are spread by spreading soil, by spreading plants, by spreading mulch on people's boots, on tractor tires. Uh, moving soil around moves the worms around. They're very, um, they can get into mulch and, and go in a bag of mulch, that kind of thing. Currently, prevention is the only way to spread. So you wanna be sure that you, when you have a plant sale, you do not have worms in your with your plants. And we'll talk about that later. If you find them in your garden, um, you should dispose of them, collect them, put them in a plastic bag, leave them in the sun for a while to sort of bake a bit, and then put them in the trash. Do not release them. Um, all earthworms can swim, actually. So just throwing them in the lake isn't gonna, doesn't kill them. I don't know if you throw them in the middle of the lake, but they can actually wash over to the edge. And so just putting them in a lake doesn't kill them. Uh, obviously fishing worms are one of the ways that worms get moved around. So um, there's, this is a quick comparison between a regular, what we call a night crawler. And I'm comparing it to a night crawler because they happen to be the largest earthworm that we have around. Um, they're a little bit different color. Their, their bodies are, are drier and sleeker. And the biggest difference it, when you just see them is their motion. They just move a lot. They, they try to get out of your hand. They, they 
uh, they don't actually jump, but they wiggle so quickly that they look like they're jumping and they have more of a snake-like movement. They just move so much more quickly than regular earthworms. And they're, they're long, they can be long. The, they, there is a telling difference between earthworms uh, that are not jumping worms and regular earthworms I mean, and uh, Asian ones. This clitellum here is closer to the head. It's flush with the body, but it goes all the way around the body. This, this clitellum goes, is like a saddle. It only goes like about three fourths of the way around the worm and it tends to be raised. I'm sure that most of you have seen worms and you've seen this, but this is a very distinct thing. It's kind of interesting. This clitellum actually serves a reproductive purpose. Cells slough off the clitellum and they slide down the body collecting eggs and sperm as they go. Um, one of the depressing parts about jumping worms is, there, is that they're parthenogenic, meaning in a pinch, they can self-fertilize, which means that even if you transplant one of them, they can produce more of themselves. Um, <clears throat> as I said, they originate from Asia, not Europe. They are directly <laughs> on the top layer, right in the right. Leaf. They don't go down, they aren't, you're not gonna find them deep. They eat, they tend to eat the duff, the, the leaves and the compost way more quickly than regular worms. And they move, they can actually move in the garden more quickly that most worms move in the dirt, which is of course harder. They, these can move across the top of the soil. And so they, they can actually cross sidewalks and that kind of depressing thing. Um, one of the other problems is that they have an annual life cycle. Even if I were in person, I couldn't bring any to show you right now because they're not alive right now. They die in the fall. Um, they, they hatch in the spring, they grow, and then by midsummer, they're ready to have to produce their cocoons, and their, which are their, egg, their eggs are in cocoons um, grouped together. And they produce them in the mid to late summer, and then they die off. So um, they, you can't see them in the spring because they're, they're just in a cocoon form. Um, so the life cycle of a jumping worm is part of the problem. I wanted to show you how small the eggs or the cocoons are. They're, um, I wish there was a dime in this picture, but there isn't, but there's a measuring thing. They're very small. They look like, um, they look like coffee grounds or they look like peppercorns and they mix in with the soil and you can't see them. So, um, all the cocoons are multiple eggs, um, in, <clears throat> They hatch when the soil temperature gets to about 50 degrees, um, you know, mid May maybe. And then as the, the hatchlings grow, they look like other worms. So it's, it's really hard to tell whether you have jumping worms until much later in the season. Um, so the biggest problem is that you can't see them in the spring or, or even early summer. And they, they're voracious eaters. They leave behind reconstituted and nutrient poor soil. They have, they're pretty uh, flexible about what they eat. They like mulch a lot. They can actually smell mulch and crawl to it. If you put a bag of mulch down that has a hole in it, um, they, you know, a covered bag, a plastic bag of mulch, they can, they can find it. Um, and they move rapidly and well, which most worms don't. At, they don't have any natural predators right now. They're, they're probably eaten by birds, but not to the extent that it would help, which is the same with those Japanese beetles. They, birds can't keep up with them. So, and, and containing their spread is difficult because you can't identify them in the springtime when most of us are sharing plants. Um, even early in the summer, their hatchlings look like other worms um, and their cocoons um, can can persist uh, for several seasons. I mean, if they don't get to hatch in spring number one, they can be there in spring number two or three. Uh, and I said, they look like garden soil, which is the biggest problem. And this is a, another picture of what they do to the soil. So they change the texture and they take out the nutrients. Um, Lee Freelich is a 
a university of Minnesota professor who talks about climate change. And he's done a lot of work on jumping worms. Uh, you can look him up. There's a lot of things that he's done that some good videos and things. Um, but this is his, um, what at, at the, he works at the Arboretum and he talks about there's one spot, I think near the azaleas where there's a lot of damage and, and they're on a hillside and the, all the root material and all, anything that would hold the dirt on the hillside is gone. So it just washes away in the heavy rain. So it's not just causing damage to the soil in terms of other plants, it's causing erosion. Um, this is a picture by Erin Buchholz, also of the U of M at Arboretum. We'll see her in a video in a bit. This is a, a forest with the native plants, the ephemerals that grow in the leaf litter or the duff layer. This is a forest where the worms have uh, decreased, have depleted the duff layer so that there's no place for the seedlings to be nourished and start growing. Most seedlings of trees need um, some protection from drying out and, for, and they need shade and they need water. And those things aren't, they're, they're depleted in this soil. So um, they, they do all the, the, the worms are doing the decomposition and there's nothing left for the plants to live in. So it's a, it's, it's, can be, it's turned into a serious problem in certain places in, in our state. Um, also, they can eat roots. Um, with the, some of the research is being done on what roots do they like or not like. Uh, so what would be safe to plant? And like I'll mention again, they don't attend, tend to be in gardens that are sunny and dry. So native gardens, sunny, dry native ones, not all natives are in shade, I mean, our son <clears throat> are a lot likely to have them, which is good news. Um, what is being done? There is actually a big project to map their progress. And it's, uh, I've, I've given you a link to that, uh, EdMaps. The university um, and the DNR want you to report worms if you get them. Uh, they're very eager to know where they are so that they can help uh, other agencies prevent the spread. Um, this is what the ed map looks like right now. And there are more worms in the United States than you see here, but we are way better at reporting. Um, there's research being done up in Duluth, but so far I don't believe that there's any reports of uh, jumping worms that far north. But we do have a concentration here. I know that they're doing research at the University of Wisconsin as well. And you can report to this site. Um, at the University of Minnesota at the Arboretum, they are doing research uh, on how to manage them. But the research has only recently started. Um, they're looking at fertilizers. For years, golf courses have known how to drive worms to the surface to get them off of the greens. Uh, and they have a certain product that they use to do that. So they're seeing if that works. Their diatomaceous earth is think kitty litter. It uh, is sharp. Uh, it's the kind of thing that you can put down to inhibit slugs. And they're hoping to see that it would either kill or slow down jumping worms because it's exactly the opposite of the kind of environment they wanna be in. Um, they don't like acidic soil. Of course, a lot of plants don't either, but um, things like blueberries and azaleas are going to do well. Um, they're looking into some biological insecticides. Obviously earthworms are not insects, but certain products um, might kill them or, uh, or make them uh, unable to reproduce, something like that. Um, obviously they're doing research on plants that are more resistant. And I'll mention that deeply rooted plants, like a lot of our natives tend to be more resistant because they, these jumping worms only work in the top layer. And if the roots go down deep, then the plant's more protected. And as I said before, <clears throat> they don't like hot, dry conditions. They like moist, cool conditions. And as I said, this research is pretty recent. Um, 
they'll be carrying continuing it this year. And as I said, it's also being done, similar research is being done at, in Wisconsin because this is a very serious problem and they're concerned. We can, there are several things we can do. We can report, and I sent a, a handout, if you will, that had the, re, there's three places that you can report and the links, I provided the links. Um, the most important thing we can do is do not move the eggs. Um, so don't share plants without washing the roots. Um, try to take the soil off of your shoes if you travel from place to place. Um, <clears throat> be very careful about where you move dirt if you have any concern about having them. Um, they, the, wor the, um, the eggs actually die at, a, oh, uh, at about 130 degrees. And most of the compost that you can buy commercially in our area, um, like from Gertens or the mulch store is heated to that temperature. I don't think mulch is heated. So you need to be really careful when buying mulch and talk to the vendor about how they treat it. Um, if you find worms, don't just move them, put them in the trash and make sure that they're basically uh, gotten rid of, killed, if you will. They don't drown, so don't drown them. Just put them in a plastic bag. <clears throat> And share, you know, let your neighbors and your, your gardening friends know about these so people are paying attention. Um, we don't want them to be shocked in August when their seedling oak tree is full of worms. And stay informed. There's really quite a lot of information. In fact, there was just an article in the, the last Northern Gardener about jumping worms. Some of the people in St. Paul that have <laughs> encountered them. So reporting in Minnesota, three places to report. The Ed Maps was the map I showed, which would put your site on a map. Laura Van Ripper is a state uh, DNR person who wants to know. And Arrest the Pest is another place where you can report uh, <clears throat> invasive species of any kind. All three are, are valid places to report. Um, they, there was a note when I looked this up that said, please don't expect resp a response from one of these. They're gonna take your information, but they're not gonna get back and say, oh yes, it was, or no, it wasn't, or um, thank you very much. They're just, they're sort of overwhelmed trying to keep up with the data that's coming in. And I think Arrest the Pest has been around for quite a while to report things like, um, well, <clears throat> bronze birch borer and that kind of thing. So let's go back to don't move eggs and worms. You're way more likely to move eggs than worms because the worms are pretty visible. Um, but cleaning footwear between gardens and after hikes is, is, it sounds like a lot of work, but it does make a difference. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, we're gonna talk about root washing sort of uh, to, to a large degree in a minute. Be sure you wash the soil off your tools before you move them from one place to another. It's always a good idea to clean your tools and um, disinfect them before you move from one spot to the other. And then try as hard as you can to purchase safe supplies such as mulch and compost and, and soil. And check with your suppliers about their prevention policies if you can. Um, the more that the nurseries get asked about how they're preventing jumping worms, the more they're going to pay attention and make sure they're doing the kind of measures that we need them to do. Sometimes that squeaky wheel does get the grease. And in this case, that would be real valuable. <clears throat> uh, this is a boot brush that you can actually carry with you or have in your yard and have in your tool bucket and clean your boots between gardens. Uh, when I was at a seminar on how to clean roots, uh, the gal was said that one one of her friends has jumping worms in the backyard, but she's been absolutely vigilant cleaning her shoes and keeping her garden tools clean and they haven't moved to the front yard. So um, it can be done with care. Uh, this is a, 
a boot brush at the Arboretum. They have several of them there, apparently. And according to Aaron Buchholz, um, they've collected dirt off of, that's been collected in, in the boot brush thing and um, grown the, taken the dirt and seen if they were, if worms would hatch out of it and they have. So cleaning uh, the boots off does actually prevent the spread. So it seems like it's kind of an over the top thing, but it's, it's proven that this is one way to not move them from one spot to the other. I, I know that they're not everywhere at the Arboretum, but there are enough places where um, they wanna be sure that they don't end up everywhere and they've put these stations. And so if you're out there, it would be very um, polite and wise to use them and maybe have your own boot brush. Um, this is Erin Buchholz. My name is Erin Buchholz. I'm the Integrated Pest Management Specialist at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. And today I'm gonna to show you how to prevent the spread of jumping worms when you're trying to share plants from one place to another. That is one of the main ways that we spread jumping worms is if we dig it out of the ground, soil and all, put it in a new place, we've taken the worms with us. So the first thing you wanna do is set up your, your space with clean tools and making sure you have a hose with some water handy and also a bucket with water handy. I have my trusty soil knife right here. As you can tell, I've done a pretty good job cleaning it off. You can't really see any soil on it. If there's caked on soil on your tools, make sure you clean those off in the last place that you worked. You always wanna make sure you're starting off with a clean tool because that's another way that worms can jump from one place to another is you've got mud on here. Their cocoons look like peppercorns, except they're even smaller than that. They blend right in with the mud and that's a way that we can spread from one area to another. So I've got a clean soil knife. I'm going to divide some of this lily of the valley and show you how to clean it off so that you can properly safely take it from one area to another without taking the worms. All right. I have my lily of the valley right here, but I don't want to take all this soil with me because I guarantee there are jumping worm cocoons all over this soil. If I plant it in a new place, those worms are going to hatch and they're going to invade the new garden. So the way that I can prevent that is by shaking off the soil back where I dug it out from, getting as much of it off before I get it wet as possible. So I'm shaking it off. I'm kind of tapping it against the sidewalk here to help me get as much soil off as I can. Put it right back where you found it. But you can see even doing that, I still have soil here. And again, there's probably cocoons in there. So I have a couple options. I have a bucket of water right here. I'm dunking it in the water and swishing it around for a little while and trying to wash off as much as I can. That's better. There might still be a little bit in here. So maybe I'll have two buckets of water just to do a final rinse. But as long as I'm looking at it and I don't see anything, I've got a little bit more right here, so I'm going to try and wash that off too. That looks a lot better. I don't really see any big chunks of soil. So that's one way to do it. But another way to do it that I think works even better is I have another one here. I already tapped as much soil as I can off, but there's still a little bit left. So if you have a garden hose handy, what you can do is go over to it. These shutoff valves that are made out of brass are my best friend because they do a really high pressure spray. You can also attach them to any other garden hose nozzle that you want to. Um, and it's a nice way to shut off the water when you're not actively using it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to wash off my plant in the same area here so that I'm not spreading worms from one area to another. I'm just gonna wash the soil right back into the bed. I'm gonna wash in the nooks and crannies of the plants too. So no soil is in the leaves or in the bud. Look at that, I think it's even cleaner than the bucket method. So this is my favorite one. So that's one way to clean off your plants. Make sure that you're washing inside too because there might be some soil hidden, but usually most of it is gonna be here. Look for anything that looks like a grain of sand and just make sure it's as clean as possible. 
Now your last step is always to clean off your tools before you move on to another area. Look at my trowel, my soil knife. It is just full of soil and I guarantee it's full of jumping worm cocoons too. I don't want to take this somewhere else. So in the same area I was digging, I'm going to wash off my tool. First I can scrape it off with my hands, get off as much soil as possible, put it right back where I was working. I'm not increasing my jumping worm numbers at all because it's the exact same place I was working but I still don't want to leave it like this. I want to get it clean. So with my shut off valve, again, I'm going to wash off my tool, get off as much of the soil as I can, try and get it as clean as possible. Because remember, these cocoons are about the size smaller than a peppercorn. They are usually only about one to three millimeters in diameter, which is pretty small, easy to miss. So I'm washing off my hands too. Get as much mud off as possible. Now, my bucket that has all this icky water in it probably has jumping worm cocoons in it too, right? I can pour it right back to where I was digging, where I removed the plants from, because again, I am not moving worms from one area to another. I'm keeping them all in the same original spot. So I'm gonna pour out my water and then I'm gonna rinse out my bucket right in the same spot. sort of plant pest issue, I like to use Lysol or the generic equivalent because Lysol, as we learned from COVID, kills just about everything that's a problem, right? So I could still have some soil borne fungus on my trowel, you know, even the water washed off most of it, but what if it didn't get it all? I want to disinfect my tools and this is always good practice when moving from a place to another even if you don't have jumping worms because there is a lot of stuff in the soil and a lot of stuff with the plants that we work with that could transfer from one plant to another so after i wash it off here is my generic lysol not going to show you the label because it's sold in under many many different names but pretty much every hardware store garden center something will have a, a disinfectant that's a, a Lysol variety. So I'm going to just go spray off my tools completely. Within 30 seconds, it's all right. I can spray off my bucket too if I want to. I'm going to tell you, usually I don't, but I'm just doing this for the camera. But usually getting it a, a thin covering of Lysol on it, it'll kill any pathogen. Pro I don't know if it kills the cocoons or not, but it definitely makes me feel better. So always start with a sanitized tool and always end with a sanitized tool. So thank you for joining us. Uh, this is another uh, YouTube. This is a, uh, when we were trying to wash roots in a kind of a group setting, people brought plants and we, we had a tarp down and we had trays to work in so that the dirt wasn't spread into the garden that we were working in. Um, we were taking the dirt out of the roots uh, and then uh, washing them so that we could set them up for a plant sale. Uh, and note that all the loose dirt is not being spread around the yard. It's going in a bucket, in a, in a uh, some sort of a container so that the person who's wherever this is happening isn't going to be <clears throat> getting worm eggs in their property. So being very fastidious about getting the dirt out and then washing the roots several times. So this is like not where the plant was taken out of the ground, but sort of a group setting where you're getting plants ready for a, a plant sale rinsing carefully and looking carefully at the roots. And that's a boot brush getting in there, getting out the um, any residue of dirt. One of the things that happens, okay, this is, uh, 
This is a pressurized spray bottle that works a lot like her hose did to get the roots cleaned up. And notice how many buckets they used several, a series of buckets to get, you know, the first wash, the second wash, the third wash, so that those roots are really clean. And be sure that all the material is off the roots. And then what happens is you can really divide the plants up pretty easily when you've taken them down to this level because you can see the roots exactly and you can make some pretty good divisions. They're gonna actually set these plants, <clears throat> these yarrow up in a, in a grouping, putting several together, but they'll know exactly how many roots they have and what quality the roots are. Um, And then this is sterilized soil, a soilless mix that they have on top of a paper towel. They're going to wrap the roots. In this case, they took three of those yarrow and put them together and they put the soil on the roots, diapered up the bare roots, uh, dampen their bare roots, uh, and then wrap them in a newspaper. According to the person that did the training, these roots wrapped like this, if they're kept moist, can be kept for up to a week. So you can prepare for a plant sale several days in advance if you're willing to sell the plants not in a pot. Um, obviously it's going to be an educational process to convince people that this is going to work, but it does work. Uh, it's the safest way to share plants and you'll just have to put it in your garden in, in your own garden dirt when you get home. So obviously labeling, labeling the plant, <laughs> always remember to label things. But I know some, oh, some of our people are gonna be surprised to, to buy plants in this form, but they do survive and they are safe. Um, Robert's gonna show us here how to strain the, um, any, residue you might have out of the water so that you can safely discard the water. This is a paint strainer that you would use over a five gallon bucket to strain any impurities out of a bucket of paint. Um, so it's, it's fine enough to strain out any uh, jumping worm eggs, cocoons that you might run into. So it looks kind of like a hairnet, but it goes on the bucket and then the water with the mud gets poured in, obviously straining out any, uh, anything we don't want. And he's going to wash, or I think Robert's speaking, but somebody else is doing the pouring. We'll wash the bucket out so that there's no uh, lingering worms anywhere. <clears throat> You wanna be sure that nothing goes off your tarp while you're working because it, it doesn't take very much. Just one, a couple of eggs moving off could uh, infect this yard. So this dirt needs to be um, kill, either killed or put in the trash. If you freeze it or put it in the sun, oh, here's some jumping worms. Uh, these are pretty small ones, pretty, pretty immature ones, but that's how fast they move. Um, some other ideas about how to control jumping worms besides washing the roots before a plant sale, which is the thing that I really want you to take away from this presentation. Um, we have been, we have done some little clinics on soil, on root washing, and I'm sure that if you asked, we probably could set one up for you. Uh, we were taught by the people from the wild ones how to do it. We're planning to do it for our plant sale in the spring. Um, and I think once people get used to it, it'll be comfortable. Sometimes the first time you do something, it's like, why are we doing this? But if you want to have a plant sale, we want to stay safe. This is what we're going to have to do. Some other suggestions about how to manage worms. Solarize the soil before planting. And I'll talk about solarizing next um, because the worms die at 104 and eggs over 130. So you can kill them with heat but that means you have to prep your soil. And of course, if they're anywhere outside where you prepped your soil, they can move in. Choose native plants with deep roots. 
buy from reputable suppliers. I know for sure that Burton's in the mulch store heat their compost, not their mulch necessarily, but their compost to over 130 degrees. The Northern Gardener suggested using coconut coir instead of wood chips. Um, it would seem logical that if the worms are visible in the fall, that might be a good time to buy your mulch and spread it because if you if they're there, you would see them and you wouldn't do you wouldn't use that mulch. Um, there is a little trick that you may have heard about bringing worms to the surface if you have them and you want to try to get rid of them, at least reduce their numbers. You can't really get rid of them, but you can try to <clears throat> reduce the numbers. Mix some mustard powder kitchen mustard powder with water and pour it over the area. Worms do not like mustard. All earthworms don't like it, but jumping worms also don't. And they can be scooped up because they'll come to the surface. Sometimes it takes a couple of applications of the mustard to get most of the worms out of the area. So that isn't going to get rid of them forever, but it, you can, it allows you to collect some of them and put them in the trash and it, it reduces the number that you have makes you feel better too, according to my friends. Solarizing soil. Um, solarizing is getting the, the soil heated up beyond the normal temperature that it would just get from the sun. And to do that, you use transparent polyethylene, which is a basically like paint, a, a paint or drop cloth, clear plastic. And you, you um, somehow adhere it to the ground and it traps solar energy. So you want to clear the area of other plants and debris, wet the soil, cover the area with plastic, um, and don't use white or black plastic, use clear plastic. Uh, be sure you keep the edges down because you need to trap the heat. So you want to bury the edges or put boards down and make sure that the heat stays in the plastic and leave the plastic in place for four weeks in the hottest part of the summer, at least four weeks. And then theoretically, when you remove the plastic, anything that's in there, like bacteria, fungi, insects, nematodes, mites, weeds, and weed seeds, will be um, killed, or at least reduced vastly. Uh, this is often done to kill the weeds before you start a garden, but it also can get, kill the, any jumping worms that you might have. Um, some names that <clears throat> you may run into if you're looking into jumping worms is Lee Friedrich. I mentioned him. Ryan Huffmeyer is the person in Duluth who's doing the research. Erin Buckholz is a young woman you saw um, digging up the plants. Angela Gupta, Cindy Hale has done some work, and Lara, Laura Van Riper of the University of Minnesota. So if you see those names, those are people that are doing current research on jumping worms. Resources. The University of Minnesota, the University of Wisconsin, and the um, College of, Ed, of Agriculture. Um, I put those in the handout that I sent. There was a recent article, the most recent Northern Gardener had a jumping worm article, and the same person had done an article in the, oh, that was the um, in April of last year. So jumping worms are around, but Laura Van Riper says, Keep calm. You can garden with jumping worms if you have them. Um, it's one of those things where you need to share that you have them. I mean, no, don't share them, but make sure that other people know so that they are careful when they walk in your garden. Um, I have a girlfriend who has a garden in North Oaks, and she was on a garden tour this summer. Uh, hundred and some people came to her garden and she knew she had jumping worms and they wore those booties like you wear when you go to um, the open houses for the parade homes. And it was fine. She was miserable about the jumping worms, but the garden tour was lovely. So um, life does go on after jumping worms, but we can do our part by not sharing dirt, by not spreading dirt and by sharing the message. So thank you. Are there any questions? There are questions in the chat. Can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you. I had a question about mulch. Are you speaking of all kinds of mulch, like um, the wood bark kind of mulch, grass mulch? Are we speaking of food mulch? You said compost, oh. Any anything and everything? 
anything and everything. Yeah, the compost that goes to the major people who make it into compost, like the mulch store and like Gertens, if you buy that, that's been heated. If you make your own, it won't be hot enough to kill the worms. Um, and I don't think that they can treat, I, I don't know if they treat the mulch to get to kill worms. Um, I didn't know who to ask, <laughs> but it can be in any kind of material. I don't, that question, I don't know if it would be in grass, if grass clippings, I'm not sure. If it would be, but I, I know that if you create a nice, warm, cool, I mean, a, a warm, moist environment, they're gonna probably come to it, if you have them. I mean, lots of us don't have them. I mean, I'm fortunate I don't have them yet, yet. But if you do have them, um, there's ways around it. And a lot of people may have them and not know it is part of the problem. I think my friend in North Oaks, she started gardening this spring and, or midsummer and picked up a, a handful of leaves and underneath it were all these worms. And that's how she learned that she had them. And my cousin, of course, had them in his mulch around his oak trees. Both of those were like mid to late summer when they really see the worms, which is the big problem. So what were some of the other questions? Oh, the chat, okay. Um, I have a question about the, yeah. uh, did, did they say Lysol for cleaning? I couldn't understand that. Lysol or something like that. You can use, a, you know, one part bleach to, to nine parts water, that kind of thing, to sterilize your, your um, tools or your bucket or something. I wouldn't put it on the plants though. Notice she didn't pour the bucket on the plants. No, I don't think no, I understand that. Enough. And, and then, no, I, every time. Mm -hmm. then I had a question about uh, when people come to your garden to visit, uh, did you say we could put them on those little blue booties from hospitals to put on their shoes just to be safe? Yes, that's what my friend did. The garden tour people did when they toured her garden. I was amazed. I thought they would say, no, you can't be on the garden tour. But they said, nope, we'll get the booties. And um, they did that. So I was amazed. <laughs> And, and I'm, you know, the person who said that they have jumping worms in the backyard, but not jumping worms in the front yard. That's impressive, too. They're being very careful. Mm -hmm. And I think it helps if you can, like, put, you know, if you can physically remove some of the worms and limit the number that you have, if you can. Other questions? Don't know. There's some questions here about coconut mulch. I think that's the jury's still out on that, but it's a thought. I don't know if if coconut is, um, it's not a native thing, so they might not like it as well as regular wood mulch or compost or leaves. There's a lot of conversation about what to do with leaves in the fall because lots of us put leaves in our gardens. I mean, I put our you know ones from the grass in the garden. And that is something that jumping worms would like. So, you know, I think if I had jumping worms, I probably wouldn't do that. I would probably get rid of the leaves somewhere, you know, send them away. Can you, so review, I hope you can you review and speak to a little bit more about the preparation of plants for the plant sale and you did all the root cleaning and then you put some sterilized soil of some sort would you but like me to have a paper that? and then wrap them in newspaper? Would you like me to replay that section? Well, either speak to it just as a quick review if you okay. don't want to go through the video. So, well, the way we had a clinic, we had several clinics where we put a huge, we tarped the whole area where we were going to work so that there was no residue falling on the person's yard. We actually did it in a driveway, but you know, each side of the driveway has grass or shrubs or something. So we've tarped the whole area, had some tables with buckets or um, uh, wash basins or something. Wash basins, you know, the ones that dish, dish pan kind of things are a nice height. And so we carefully, carefully we rinse the roots um, of all the dirt. And for, first we obviously, uh, people were instructed to bring the plants with as little soil on them as possible. Okay, so we weren't 
they, people were not bringing plants in pots. They were bringing plants that they had already kept the dirt in their own yard, but they didn't wash them in their own yard. And then we washed them uh, together. So every root was washed very thoroughly, rinsed three times, and then we put it, <clears throat> the plant on a piece of paper towel, wrapped it up, moistened the whole thing, wrapped it in a paper towel, I mean, a, a newspaper, a couple layers of newspaper, moistened it again and put it in a bucket. Labeled it, labeled it, put it in the bucket. It's, it's not hard, it's just tedious. It's actually a pretty nice social event. We had fun. I mean, it's depressing, but you know, you're all working on the same project and you can, you can really see what the root structure is of the plant and decide whether you can divide it at that point. So that's a, a plus. What was the response from the public? We haven't done it for the public yet. We only learned to do this this fall. But so we were going to do it this spring. Yeah. I, I think a lot of people are aware of jumping worms. And I think if you have information that says, this is why we're doing this, we're doing this to make your lives better. I would, ass we're assuming that they're going to be supportive. Um, it so is possible to take those plants and put them in sterilized, you know, in sterilized soil and pot them all up. But that gets expensive and then you cut into your profits, you know, and you don't really need to do that. I mean, most people can take a bare root plant and go home and plant it just as they could if they had a plant in a pot. So I was going to say, well, I guess we might have to be creative in how we advertise about bare root plant sale. Well, I, would, <laughs> I would say, that, you know, I would um, make it a positive. You know, we are we're using the latest um, research, we are making sure that we're not contributing to this problem. I mean, people by now are used to invasive problems. I mean, they know about the emerald ash borer. They, they know about buckthorn. Um, and they, they, a lot of people who are interested in plants want to keep things as safe as possible. So it's a plus, I would think. I'm hoping. <laughs> we're hoping. I have a Put question up, about that. Mulch. Just a, a follow-up question. Are there any plants that you would not bear root and sell at your plant sale? I don't think we've gotten that far, but that's a very good question. Um, I'm trying to think most, the, the thing about our plant sales and probably yours is we've only ever done them in the springtime when the plants are pretty small anyway. Um, and they're being dug up. I, I, I'm i trying to go through all the plants I can think of that we sell. I can't think of any that couldn't ha have their roots washed, but maybe there are some. I just, we have, a, that's a good question. I think maybe we'll find out after we do a couple of these. <laughs> can you think of any that, that come to mind, anyone? Um, I mean, obviously bulbs, if you're sharing lily bulbs, they can be washed, they are still that way anyway um i think some grasses might be hard they get so compacted you know some even the ornamental hard. grasses yeah they aren't usually um many of the ornamental grasses aren't really up in the springtime i don't know how well you do it you know we don't have them that often at our sale because they aren't uh they don't look like anything in the springtime they start looking like something in june and that's you know so that's our plant sale is usually stuff that looks like something by May, <laughs> but yes, they grasses would be hard to clean the roots. But you know, if you if you dip it enough times in water, I think you can get it clean. What about it's cocoa bean a, mulch? Cocoa bean mulch. I wondered about that. I don't know. That's a very good question, and I could try to look into that and get back to you. I could get back to you about that. Um, because it has such a different smell and, and structure. The only problem is a lot of people I know don't like it because it molds so badly, um, at least in my experience. I don't know about yours, but, uh, and it's pretty expensive too. But, um, and I, I think it'd be the same thing about cocoa, um, coconut, that free coconut stuff. And I don't know how that decomposes in terms of, 
being good for the soil. It was one of the things that was mentioned in that most recent Northern Gardener article about some of the things people are trying. So that's why I said stay informed. I mean, I think the Northern Gardener and other sources are very in tune to this and we'll hear more about it. Um, there is a question in the chat about lawn care companies. And yes, I think that that is a concern if they're moving tractors from one place to another, yes. Um, that lawn care companies are gonna need to figure out how to make sure that they don't move soil because they do with their, with their um, equipment and on the feet of their operators, you know. It, they really have discovered at the Arboretum that the dirt on the bottom of boots can move worms and eggs and stuff. So that's not a minor problem. Do we, do we know if animals also transport these um, eggs if they're in the soil at this point, at the, you know, in that type of um, transport? Because I live out in a semi-rural area where there are, you know, wildlife and so forth. I'm sure they do. And that's, I don't know how, you know, I, like in deer in their hooves and stuff. I would think so. Yeah. But I don't know if you, um, my... Um, the information I have from that map, which I've seen a more detailed one, but I couldn't find it. I think they tend to be right now, the worm infestations tend to be more where there are, there's lots of gardening activity going on, the arboretums and some of the, um, the urban areas. I, I haven't seen too much just out in the hinterlands as much. But you know, all it takes is one bad pot of soil to get them out there. Well, thank you for the opportunity to talk about jelly worms, I guess.